Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar on Senior and Intermediate Fellowships by TBD Welcome Trust India Alliance. Today, there will also be a session by one of our fellows on writing an effective fellowship application. I hope you all are doing very, very well and taking good care of yourself and your dear ones. My name is Banyakar, and I am the Communication and Public Engagement Officer at DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. So before we begin on with the sessions, I will very briefly introduce the organization that I represent. DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, popularly known as India Alliance also. So India Alliance is a public charity registered in India that funds research in health and biomedical sciences. India Alliance invests in transformative ideas and supportive research ecosystems to advance discovery and innovation to improve health and well-being for all. It is funded by the Department of Biotechnology Government of India and the Welcome Trust UK. Apart from funding research, we also fund various programs that promote national and international collaborations. Uh, we conduct workshops for professional skill building and capacity building in the country. And we also initiate interventions to strengthen the Indian research ecosystem. We are committed to making science more accessible. And we do this by facilitating various public engagement uh, opportunities and programs uh, in India. Um, so uh, before we dive into the sessions to help us all better navigate the console and participate in the webinar, here are a few housekeeping tips. Uh, the video and the microphone of all the attendees will remain switched off during the webinar. Uh, you can leave questions for the speakers anytime uh, during the webinar in the question box. You can also raise your electronic hand uh, to be unmuted to ask a question. During the webinar, we will launch a few polls uh, that will flash on your screen. Please do participate in the polls to help our speakers better understand their audience today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. And in case the webinar ends abruptly due to a technical glitch, you can join back the webinar using the same, register, uh, same link that uh, you found in your inbox. Uh, also, if you plan to share any highlights from today's workshop through social media, please do feel free to tag us through the social media handles that you can see on your screen now. We have two sessions planned for this event today. Session one will focus on what it takes to draft an effective fellowship application. And in session two, we will discuss the remit mandate eligibility requirements and more of the senior and intermediate fellowships in basic medical research. To start with session one, uh, I, uh, I would um, request you all to participate in this quick poll before we launch the session one. Can you all please take the Thank you. So um, that gives us a good snapshot of our audience today. And uh, we can now, I think, without my much further delay, get into the session uh, that we have uh, for all of you today. Um, I think that all of you would agree that having a research question is just not enough to get funding uh, for science. And it is equally important to have a good research plan and to be able to communicate that. And this is why grants writing is a very important skill for the researchers. Uh, to discuss these very aspects, without further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Mahalakshmi, Senior Fellow India Alliance at Iser Bhopal. Mahalakshmi got her a doctoral degree from IIC in Molecular Biology and has her postdoctoral training at Sanford Burnham uh, Medical Research Institute and Jola Institute for Allergy and Immunology USA. 
Mahalakshmi's work in molecular biophysics is widely recognized and she has had many awards in her career. More recently, the Young Researcher Award by Lady Charter Memorial Trust, the Indian Peptide Society Young Scientist Award, and the Sub Women Excellence Award. Mahalakshmi is the recipient of both the Intermediate and the Senior Fellowship of India Alliance, and also the DST Swarna Jayanti Fellowship. Uh, welcome, Mahalakshmi. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is all yours now. Thank you, Vanya. It's a fantastic opportunity to actually be able to communicate with people. And uh, this is a very nice initiative that uh, India Alliance has actually taken. And I'm very happy to be a part of it. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly start by saying that uh, fellowship or a grant writing in general is more of an art than a science and everyone has a different approach to it so i'm only going to share my experience it may or may not work for you but i hope that whatever it is that i have experienced and uh, what i have gone through will help in some way to help each of you uh, write out a proper fellowship and a successful fellowship or even a successful grant from any funding agency so um, what I usually suggest or what I usually do is uh, to start formulating an idea well ahead of time. So having a head start, having at least a year or two years is head start in terms of the idea that you're developing really helps because it allows a, the person or it definitely allows me to work out both the positives as well as the negatives and work out what are the potential pitfalls and try to address it uh, with time or with uh, new technology that is available or newer approaches. So having this brainstorming session uh, within yourself or even with other peers or internationally or domestically really helps. So having a good head start, a year or two years is head start, especially for a grant of this magnitude is very important. Now, uh, moving on to the second aspect, which is the actual writing process. Uh, can we just have the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, so while you're writing, it's very important that you tell a story because you are an expert in your field. The next person who's reading it does not have to be an expert in your field. So they would be an expert in the general area of biology or biological sciences or physical or chemical sciences, mathematical sciences even, but they would not be able to uh, actually relate to or understand what it is that you're trying to tell them if you use too much jargon. So you have to write it in a way that it is easy to understand and it is appealing to the general scientific community. So using pictures instead of writing too many words really helps and being concise in the amount of words that is actually uh, included in any application really helps because uh, quite frankly, nobody has the time to actually read through 20 different pages of just paragraph after paragraph of information that is presented. Instead, if everything can be condensed into two or three explanatory images, then it conveys the story better. So avoiding jargons, being concise, and most importantly, everyone is enthusiastic about his or her research idea. But what they fail to do is to communicate that enthusiasm in the form of words and pictures when they are putting together a grant application. So if that can be achieved, if you can successfully convey your enthusiasm on paper, then that itself does the trick. And uh, lastly, uh, can we have the last slide, please? There are certain points that one has to actually consider while writing a grant application. Um, the last slide. So the points that one have to, has to consider is there are so many applicants, so many, many talented, equally talented, perhaps better applicants. So why should the committee or why should the reviewers support your application over another person's application? So that justification must be very nicely put out in a grant in the in both in terms of the quality of the science that is being proposed in terms of supporting justification and in terms of your enthusiasm and capability to accomplish it. So the other thing that is also important is to know your limits, both in terms of time, in terms of space and in terms of uh, what you can achieve independently and what you can achieve through collaborative work. The um, 
other important aspect to consider is if it is it an exist uh, extension of your existing work or is it something new that you're proposing because sometimes what is perceived as if it is a direct extension of your existing work it is likely that the entire idea was not yours and it uh, the committee always generally tries to you know favor people who come in with novel ideas and not borrowed ideas from somebody else like a postdoctoral um, advisor so even if it is an extension of your existing work try to make it as diverse as it is possible or as different as it is possible from the existing work so that people see you in the application and not your supervisor then um, the most important aspects are you are responsible for what other people understand you are not responsible for just what you tell them but what they understand as well so try to write it in a way that it is easy to understand and um, rule of thumb is if you are able to convey your ideas to a 14 year old then you are a successful uh, grants writer so try to convey the idea to people who are outside your field not necessarily a 14 year old but people who are outside your field who are in totally different fields and see if you are able to convince them if they are able to understand it then write it in the same way because then people who are reading your grant will also be able to understand it and appreciate the work that you do or you have proposed to do so this is what uh, i try to follow it doesn't happen all the time but i try my level best to do it and usually what i also have is uh, give a copy of the grant to somebody else who's not in my field, who's not even a biologist, have them read it and let me know if they have understood at least 30% of what I've written and modulate it accordingly. So this is what I have to share in terms of my tips and trips, uh, tricks for writing an effective fellowship application. And um, what I would also like to do is to use this opportunity to share what it is that I have uh, done so far. So um, when I started off uh, my PhD program, it was in peptide chemistry. And uh, I was so fascinated by NMR that I switched my fields for my postdoctoral work to do NMR spectroscopy. And when I joined as an independent faculty over here at ISER Bhopal uh, 11 years ago, I uh, did not have the facility to you know, there was no NMR machine which was purchased yet, so I could not set it up. Instead of sitting idle, I was motivated by people who are near and dear to start something new. And that is, in a way, a mark of a scientist. You should not be restricted by the lack of technology or the lack of facilities. You should still find a way to execute a research idea that you are passionate about. So I was very interested in membrane proteins and I started work on membrane proteins using different approaches that did not necessarily involve a spectroscopic, uh, NMR spectroscopic structural characterization. And that has worked out quite well. So I used this preliminary information to put together an India Alliance Intermediate Fellowship application and I did include some preliminary data in it. So based on whatever I was able to achieve in the past five years with my India Alliance Intermediate Fellowship, I used that as a launching pad to explore something even more, even greater, like much broader in terms of in the field of mitochondrial bioenergetics. So it has been a stepwise progress for me and uh, for many of us, irrespective of whether we get well established uh, in labs or whether we have to start our own labs, the journey is more or less the same. So the only uh, thing that I would like to emphasize and convey to everyone is don't be afraid that technology is not there. Just do what it is that you are passionate about and success will always follow. Thank you. So that's all I have and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mahalakshmi, and thank you for sharing that very crisp success recipe uh, with our audience today. I, I think the pointers that you shared uh, will be very, very helpful for them when they are writing their fellowship applications. Uh, we have yeah, many questions. We have many questions pouring in, and I would also encourage our participants uh, of this webinar to drop their questions in the question box. And while they do that, we already have a couple of questions that we can start discussion. Uh, the first one here is for somebody wants to know that if if a if, if it's a hypothesis-driven project that they are 
uh, working on. What is the expectation in terms of preliminary data and experimental evidence uh, that they should have uh, when they are writing a fellowship application or grant application? So um, most of the grant applications, especially if it is a starting grant application, uh, do not mandate uh, preliminary data or even experimental evidence. But I would say if you have it, no matter how insignificant you think it is, just include it. It's not going to harm. So having some preliminary data always helps. But if you don't have any preliminary data, it's not going to harm the application, provided the science is logical and it is sound. Yes, yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And uh, another related question is what exactly needs to be prepared for the preliminary application in terms of research proposal? Can you just elaborate a little bit on what it takes to write that uh, winning research proposal? Um, if I were to relate it to writing a manuscript, it's like writing the introduction and the conclusion uh, and pitching the story. So that is what goes into a preliminary application, not the details of the experiments, what it is that you plan to do. Those kind of things can be reserved for a full application. So you just have to pitch it right in a preliminary application. That's all that is. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, many people have also asked us how is it that the career of the applicant uh, how is the career of the applicant important when they are writing or preparing an uh, application uh, do track uh, record and publication both in terms of number and in terms of impact factor affect the selection process even even if the proposal is strong I mean, how would you uh, how would you rate both these aspects in a fellowship application? I um, have reviewed and I have sat in committees uh, before, and uh, what we usually look for, and this is from my experience, uh, what we usually look for is whether or not the application is sound. That is the foremost criterion. Now, uh, the next thing that would come in is whether or not the candidate is capable of doing it because it is not necessary that the candidate has all the expertise. The question that we try to uh, probe for is whether the candidate is capable of finding the right expertise and getting herself or himself trained or getting the help that is needed to make sure that this project is a success. Are they capable of doing that? I suppose that is more important than having uh, a huge track record both in terms of quality or quantity or coming from uh, top-notch institutes so the uh, proposal as well as the ability of a candidate the enthusiasm of the candidate is more important true thank you um, the next one is again uh, related uh, what are the most important considerations by the reviewers in terms of part prior publication, host institute, proposal, experience? Okay, um, so in terms of, again, prior publications, uh, if the reviewers actually have a look at it, having, I mean, this, this is again my opinion, having a few author paper in a society journal versus a multi-author multi-institutional paper in a high profile journal the waiting is more for the few author paper because there we get the impression that the individual has actually done most of the research and therefore is capable of executing mm -hmm. the project in terms of the experiments so the impact factor or the impact of the journal is not as important as the impact of the work itself and the same thing goes for a host institution. You could have host institutions which are very well established and you'll still find people who are very good, average, and not that very good. So this applies for pretty much every institute, every university, not just in India, everywhere in the world. So the host institute per se does not or should not play an important role in deciding whether or not a candidate gets an app, uh, gets funded. And uh, what were the other two things? Sorry, the host institute, the man, the papers. Experience. Uh, research experience. So the experience basically tells us whether or not 
the person uh, is capable of working and capable of translating their idea into something that is tangible. So whether this experience is in the same field or in a different field, it doesn't matter because experience is still experience. So yes. we just look for whether or not the person is capable of doing something, anything science related. And since we were uh, talking about the uh, experience and how if uh, uh, if an applicant doesn't have uh, the relevant experience but still can have collaborators or yes. other people who can uh, the, who they can engage with, um, one of our audience members wants to know: Can we have two co-principal investigators from two countries uh, on the on the application? Mm -hmm. Uh, so for India Alliance, maybe you can comment on the policies. Yes, we uh, But yeah, yeah. But having uh, co-investigators or having collaborators, um, it all depends again on how much the collaborator is going to be involved and what is the significance of having the collaboration. If it is really going to take the project up to the next level, then it's nice to collaborate. Or if it is something that you can do on your own, then uh, it is easier to simply get yourself trained in the potential collaborators lab and execute the project yourself. So it's going to be a judgment call uh, based on what expertise is required and what they bring to the table. Yes, thank you for that note because many of uh, many of the participants today want to know that how is it that collaborators can add to their project and how it strengthens their project or their application. Um, with that, I, uh, I can, can take. Yeah, I can just say that uh, for both my uh, intermediate as well as my senior fellowship uh, applications, I did not have any collaborators listed. So, if that's of any help, <laughs> there are people who had collaborators, and their applications are also successful. So, it all depends on what the collaborator is going to do versus what the applicant is going to do. Yes. Yes. Um, and a very practical question here, is it a bad idea to propose work, say in three to five years, that needs equipment currently not available at the host institute? How does one plan uh, for this kind of work? Well, uh, it's the same thing that I actually started off uh, with saying, you have to plan two to three years in advance. And um, Proposing something that has not yet been established in the host institute should not be a barricade. In fact, uh, in my own experience, I uh, brought in uh, fluorescence-based kinetics measurements at ISA Bhopal, which is actually not available anywhere in Madhya Pradesh. So that was something that I brought in midway uh, through my intermediate fellowship. And I didn't have any problems because I had planned for this in advance. So it's fine. That should not hamper any any applicant from proposing something challenging. Yes. Thank you for that. And uh, a very important question is: How does one prepare for interview in in fellow uh, in uh, sub which subsequently happened uh, to the application process? Uh, what are the aspects that one should pay uh, attention to while preparing for these interviews? Okay, uh, so uh, the interview usually has a four to five minute presentation followed by discussion and questions from the committee members. So uh, in all of these cases, when they say five minutes, stick to the five minutes, do not exceed <laughs> it. Give the overview, just the overview. Do not go into the details because the details are already available in the application and the committee members have read it. So they just want a brief overview within five minutes. In fact, I remember my uh, intermediate fellowship presentation, I was given five minutes and I completed it probably in three minutes. And uh, as far as a <laughs> question answer session is concerned, um, they are going to ask you uh, what are uh, questions related to the potential pitfalls of the application. So again, like I said, prepare for it well in advance. And if you don't have an answer yet, then just say that you don't know it yet and you're happy to consider it in the future. There's no one, no human being actually has an answer for every question. And it's okay to say, I don't know. In fact, that is the first step in learning something new, to acknowledge that you don't know so that you can seek answers. So 
it's uh, always a good idea to not lie to the committee because the committee has seen enough applicants to know when you're bluffing. So it's easier to just say, I don't know and ask them for their input because they're all there to guide every junior faculty who's climbing the ladder. True. Thank you very much, Mahalakshmi, for those valuable inputs and thoroughly enjoyed the discussion with you today. And I'm, I'm sure our audience also enjoyed your discussion. It was great having you today with us. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> We can now move on to our second session, which is about the fellowship, the senior and the intermediate fellowship. But before that, can we just take one more poll, the third poll, please? This would help our next speaker to better engage with the audience. Please, uh, I request all of you to participate in this poll. And now I would uh, like to invite uh, my colleague, Sarah Iqbal from the Grants team of India Alliance to take us through India Alliance's Senior and Intermediate Fellowship in light of its remit, eligibility, provisions, requirements, and the application form. It's all yours now, Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Banya. So I'm sharing my screen. Please confirm if you can see it. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, sir. Great. So uh, let me welcome you all to this next session. Uh, of this particular webinar on senior and intermediate fellowships. We've designed the webinar in such a way that first we'll talk about some eligibility and policy related matters that will help you decide most suitable scheme to apply for. Next, I will take you through the application process uh, through the different uh, form, uh, to different sections of the form and highlight the most important things that you need to keep in mind while you're filling out the form. So, uh, let's first talk about the India Alliance Fellowship Program and some of the provisions of the program. Our fellowship programs are designed in a way that there's a lot of emphasis on the lead investigator. The lead investigator has the flexibility to design the roadmap for completing their goals and objectives. We provide flexible and generous funding uh, to the investigator to achieve these goals. We don't have any restrictions based on age or nationality. Our eligibility is assessed in uh, the form of post PhD research experience. And in case you've taken a non research career break, either due to parental duties or relocation or um, working in an industry, we will give due regard to these career breaks. Uh, we may uh, seek uh, uh, documentary proof uh, if that's required, but that's for a later stage. Uh, we also don't require you to have any kind of a salaried position or commitment uh, towards a salaried position uh, before you apply for our fellowships. Our uh, application process is completely online. It's user friendly. You can use our online grants management system to fill in the application form. We also encourage our fellows and our potential applicants to pursue interdisciplinary research in case they want to venture slightly outside of their research area. That's also more than welcome. We provide opportunities to develop international and national collaborations in the form of travel and subsistence funds for attending conferences, carrying out a part of their research work in another institute. One of the key features of our fellowship program is international peer review. So the full applications uh, that we receive are shared with international experts from all over the world uh, so that they can provide comments and feedback on the project proposal. These comments and feedback are then relayed back to the applicant so that they can use it to strengthen their proposal. Uh, this is what the India Alliance Fellowship lifecycle looks like. We have a two-step application process where uh, applicants are first required to uh, fill in a preliminary application. This is a shorter document, requires the essential uh, a CV, a 750-word abstract uh, of your project proposal, uh, recommendation letters. 
based on the preliminary application, uh, this will be judged for eligibility and uh, competitiveness within the cohort. The shortlisted applicants will then be asked to submit a full application, which will then be shared with uh, uh, our international selection committee. Now, full application is a more comprehensive document. You'll have to outline your entire project proposal, the techniques that you're going to use. Uh, this is also the stage where you fill in the budget. These applications are shared with the international um, peer reviewers and uh, together with the feedback from the peer reviewers, our internal selection committee shortlist the candidates for interview. Based on the performance in the interview, candidates are either awarded or declined. Uh, this entire process takes about 10 months, which is why it's uh, good to start planning ahead in time. Uh, one of the key features to keep in mind while planning your application is eligibility. So let's shift our focus uh, to the senior and intermediate fellowship schemes right now. Uh, what are these schemes for, like who can apply for these schemes? So these, uh, this particular scheme, senior and intermediate fellowship under the basic biomedical research category is open for basic science and veterinary researchers with the post PhD uh, research experience of four to 15 years. If you look at the mandate of our intermediate fellowships, it's for researchers who are looking to establish an independent research program uh, within the country. And typically, uh, scientists with the post PhD research experience of four to seven years apply for this particular scheme. Senior fellowships are meant for people who already have an established independent lab and they are willing to expand their research program further. Uh, typically, researchers uh, having a post-PhD research experience in excess of seven to eight years apply for this particular scheme. But then again, these are general guidelines. You are the best judge of uh, your own career stage, and uh, based on that, you can make a decision to apply to either of these schemes. Another question that we receive a lot is about REMIT, the kind of project proposals that we do support. Uh, please know that our REMIT is very broad. We support biomedical research that is relevant to human and animal welfare. So it's a broad category, but uh, for if some reason you're unsure of whether your proposed project falls within our remit or not, you can write to us at uh, info at indialliance.org. Please ensure that you also attach your CV and a 200 uh, word summary of your uh, proposed uh, work for us to assess and get back to you. Um, another thing to keep in mind are the key policies and conditions. Uh, let's begin with the resubmission policy. We have a very strict resubmission policy when it comes to full application submissions. So candidates who submit a full application and are declined um, in the successive stages, they cannot reapply to the same scheme. Uh, but this particular, the, the, uh, so they can't reapply to the same scheme or to a junior scheme. But uh, in case uh, they wish to apply for another higher scheme, say it's an intermediate application which was declined, they can apply for the senior scheme. This particular criteria does not apply to preliminary application. If you are declined at the prelim stage, you may reapply to the same competition. We also have the dual fellowship policy. As per the dual fellowship policy, uh, you cannot avail uh, funding from India Alliance if you um, hold an active fellowship from some other funding agency. You'll have to relinquish that fellowship. Uh, so at any given point of time, you cannot draw fellowship support from any other um, source if your India Alliance fellowship is active. Our uh, fellows also have a time commitment. They're supposed to uh, dedicate their research time, specific amount of their research time to uh, their India Alliance project. So this is 80% of the research time for uh, intermediate fellows. Senior fellows are required to dedicate 70% of their research time to their India Alliance project. And um, about less than eight hours per week, uh, they can spend on non-research activities. As mentioned before, uh, we do not require you to have a salaried appointment while you're, uh, when you're applying for our fellowships. And uh, you can draw personal support from the fellowship uh, uh, from the fellowship amount. And this will become more clear when I talk about the provisions of the scheme in the next slide. Uh, but before that, let's also focus on the policy on plagiarism. We are very particular about plagiarism, uh, including self-plagiarism. So if there is a lot of uh, copy pasting from other sources, this can be grounds for rejection of your uh, application, both at the prelim as well as the full application stage. So uh, moving on to the fellowships, uh, the provisions of the fellowship. 
uh, both the intermediate and the senior fellowships are for a period of five years. The budget cap, that is the amount that you can request for your project is 3.6 crores for intermediate fellows and about 4.5 crores for senior fellows. Within this uh, budget, you can request uh, funds for consumables, for equipment. In case you don't have a salaried position at the host institution, you can also request funds for your personal support. But we have a cap on this. You can request up to three. Uh, you can request 13.8 lakhs if you're an intermediate fellow. So this 13.8 lakhs per annum. For senior fellows, the amount is 16.1 lakhs per annum. In case you already have a salaried position at the host institution and you're being paid above our cap, we will not provide any. Uh, uh, funds for your personal support. However, if your uh, uh, salary is less than our annual cap, then we will top it up uh, to ensure that you receive uh, uh, the salary uh, which is at par with our salary cap. So in case, for example, if you're an intermediate fellow and you're receiving about 10 lakhs per annum, we will provide the remaining 3.8 lakhs so that uh, you are at par with our salary cap. You can also request support staff um, for your project for intermediate fellows, we you can request up to two uh, support staff positions. Senior fellows can request up to four support staff positions. And this is including postdocs. So you can request uh, funds uh, for recruiting postdocs, PhD students, and also technicians. Then there is this component of work outside the host institution. This is applicable to uh, intermediate uh, fellows. Within this uh, uh, particular uh, parameter, uh, intermediate fellows can request funds for travel and subsistence for up to 12 months uh, to work outside India in another lab. Uh, the funds provided for subsistence are at the tune of $3,000 per month. This will be in addition to the personal support that you will receive for that particular month. Senior fellows can use their transferable funds uh, to meet this expense as per their need. We also provide uh, uh, funds for travel to meetings, not just for the fellow, but also for the support staff. So for the fellows, we provide funds uh, at the rate of 1.5 lakhs per year for intermediate fellows and two lakhs per year for senior fellows to attend conferences abroad. For uh, research uh, staff that is uh, um, appointed for the project for both intermediate and senior fellows, we provide about one lakh per year for uh, them to attend conferences and meetings. There's also a contingency of about 7.5 lakhs and 10 lakhs for intermediate and senior fellows respectively for the entire duration of five years. Another uh, uh, section on which we receive a lot of queries is roles on the application. So let's first start with the mandatory roles that are required at the prelim stage. Uh, at this stage, we require you to full, uh, 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 to fill out all the details about yourself, which is the lead applicant. Uh, the other mandatory requirement at this stage is uh, recommendation letters. At least one uh, recommendation letter has to be attached to your application for it to be submitted on the portal. And uh, sometimes for technical reasons, we also call it uh, the supervisor, the role of a supervisor, but it's not necessary for you to approach only a supervisor. This can be a person who's worked closely with you and can comment on your uh, uh, ability, uh, scientific ability. Then, in addition to that, we have certain optional roles. Uh, these are sponsor, mentor, external sponsor, and collaborator. Now, who's a sponsor? A sponsor is someone who has the administrative authority to sign up to India Alliance award conditions and policies. Uh, this would typically be uh, the administrative head of your host institution or the head of your department or the research division. This particular role is optional at this stage, but it will become mandatory at the full application stage for both intermediate as well as senior fellows. Now, a mentor is someone is a senior uh, scientist who can provide feedback on not just uh, the technical details of the project, but also uh, on your career trajectory, who can transition your uh, in the, uh, tra transition you to become an independent researcher. This particular uh, role is again optional at the prelim stage. It will become mandatory for uh, intermediate fellows at the full application stage uh, and will remain optional for uh, senior fellows even at the full application stage. The other role is external sponsor. So external sponsor is someone whose lab uh, you will work in while availing your work outside host institution. External sponsor is an optional role. Um, 
it applies to intermediate fellows uh, mostly and it's an optional role at uh, both the uh, preliminary stage as well as the co-application stage and then uh, there is uh, this role of collaborators uh, collaborators again are optional both for uh, intermediate and senior applicants at the prelim stage as well as the uh, full application stage if you want to learn more about the roles on the application, you can look up this on uh, our website. This is the link where you can find uh, more details about roles on the application. And uh, uh, you can also go to our website, go to the applicants corner and find this particular uh, section. Now, with uh, more clarity on uh, the, uh, the roles and various sections and policy matters, mm -hmm. uh, we can now divert our attention to the whole application process. So once you have decided to apply to a particular scheme, you can uh, log in to our online grants management system, India Land System, ISS for short. If you're a new user, please register yourself and create a new account. For existing users, we can uh, simply enter the information, log in, and uh, uh, select the appropriate scheme. So this is what the uh, uh, scheme page would look like once you have selected uh, the scheme. For example, in this case, I've selected the Intermediate Preliminary 2021 Round 2. And uh, once you've selected this, uh, on the left-hand panel, you can find the various sections on, of, uh, on the application. So there are sections uh, dealing with project summary, host institutions, sponsor details, etc. And uh, we will uh, we, I'll take you through all these sections, highlighting the most important things to keep in mind while filling out these sections in the next few slides. So um, let's dive right into it. Well, let's begin with the project summary. Uh, in this section, you will be required to provide a research summary of about 750 words. Uh, please stick to the word limit in this case. Provide the references, um, uh, mention the references at the appropriate position in the research summary text. Also provide a list of the references uh, and uh, follow a uniform uh, referencing style while listing out the references. Provide a succinct title that also captures the uh, essence of the project. And uh, this may seem very obvious, language and formatting, but it's a good idea to revise your proposal once before submitting to ensure that there are no language issues or formatting issues uh, within the proposal. This is a, a mark of good craftsmanship and it's a feature of most successful applications. So please pay attention to this. Now, one of the most important features uh, to keep in mind while filling out this section is our plagiarism policy. We don't entertain any kind of plagiarism, including self-plagiarism. And uh, if uh, there are instances of uh, plagiarism, it can be grounds for rejection even at the prelim stage. So kindly be mindful of it while you're filling out your project summary. Next uh, comes the host institution details. Now, uh, at this particular point, uh, filling uh, or identifying a host institution is mandatory. So you will have to choose a host institution while you're filling out your preliminary application form. Uh, Kindly note that India Alliance disperses funds to not-for-profit organizations only. Most academic institutions in India are not-for-profit, but in case uh, you are not sure, it's a good idea to check with the administrative division of your organization once before applying. While filling out this particular section, uh, kindly fill out the department and the city fields also. Don't leave it vacant. There will be questions on the choice of the host institution and the support that you expect to receive. Kindly um, provide a suitable answer to both these questions. That will make your application stronger. Uh, we also have the sponsor details section. While it is optional uh, to identify, to fill in the details for a sponsor at this stage, if you already have identified a sponsor, uh, please enter the full details of the sponsor, including name, designation, organization, department, etc. In case for some reason you have not identified a sponsor at the host institution so far, that's fine. You can uh, mention the reason why this is so. Another important uh, section at this stage is uh, the letters of recommendation section. As mentioned before, adding at least one letter of recommendation is mandatory at this stage. Without this, your application will not be submitted. At uh, this particular, uh, in this particular section, you are supposed to add people who will provide recommendation letters. You can add more than one person if that is uh, if 
if that's what you want to do please uh, add while adding uh, please fill out all these information right from name organization department city etc once you add the name of this person uh, an email will be triggered to the person so that they can submit their uh, letter of recommendation uh, so please be, ensure that you submit the right email address if you do not submit the right email address the person will never get to the link they will not be able to upload the letter so please be mindful of these a couple of things while you're filling out this section um, you can also check if the person is already added to our database when you're checking for this you can uh, please check either by name or by email don't use both the fields simultaneously and in case the person is not added on our database you can add the contact to our database that's also uh, uh, possible the next uh, section is uh, adding the mentor details again as mentioned before this particular or adding a mentor or identifying a mentor it's optional at the prelim stage if you have identified a mentor it's a good idea to uh, add the specifics um, add the name organization city there will be a question on the um, the kind of guidance that you expect to receive from your chosen mentor please fill out these details with a suitable answer in case you've not identified a mentor at this stage that's fine but this is something that you can keep in mind for your full application stage uh, because this will become mandatory at the full application stage for intermediate fellows for senior fellows it will remain uh, optional both at uh, the prelim as well as the full application stage next we come to the applicant details section uh, now applicant details uh, requires you to fill out your uh, contact information uh, degree uh, phd viva date etc please provide valid contact information so that in case we need to contact you we can um, shoot an email to you or even call you whatever so uh, please um, enter your valid contact information this information uh, is entered in the manage my details section and in case you need to edit it you can do that by going to this particular uh, section please also mention your highest degree for this uh, particular round the highest degree would either be phd or md mention your phd viva date in terms of months and years now this is not the date on which you receive your degree this is uh, the date on which you appear for the phd viva so please be mindful of this distinction when you're filling out this uh, section also mention your present status at the host institution if you already have a faculty position or if you're con being considered for a faculty position kindly uh, mention that in the space provided in case you do not have a faculty position that's also fine just mention that in the space provided um, next we come to the applicant cv now uh, this is the section where you will provide your uh, uh, background of your education uh, the previous positions that you've held in the past again these sections are pulled out from the management details section in case you need in case you didn't exit you have an existing account and in case you need to edit these sections you can go to management details section and edit this information if you've had any career breaks this is the place to mention this kindly mention this in uh, kindly mention the dates and also provide a reason when you're mentioning uh, career breaks uh, while providing your um, uh, background uh, education as uh, the background of your education please mention any um, past supervisors that you've worked with this can be your phd supervisor postdoc supervisor etc kindly uh, add these details in the section provided also mention your publications it, uh, please mention your publications in the reverse chronological order starting with the most recent first use a uniform referencing style and um, the most important thing uh, here is to provide full citations please don't provide uh, truncated citations provide full citations with names of all authors if you are the first author for uh, a given publication underline your name and in case you are the corresponding author please add an asterisk next to your name in that particular citation for uh, uh, this particular scheme, scheme we also uh, would require you to upload your uh, Google a fire shot of your Google Scholar profile. So please update your Google Scholar profile uh, and then take a snapshot and attach it at the required uh, position. You will also find questions on your scientific career to date and your reasons for applying. Uh, these sections will uh, help you highlight your motivation for applying for this fellowship and uh, you can supplement a suitable answer at uh, uh, these particular sections. 
The next section uh, in the application form is other grants and applications. So it's highly likely that you already have um, a fellowship application or a grant application that is in um, uh, that is under progress if mostly if you're a senior fellow in that case please mention uh, the the grants or fellowship uh, fellowships that are under progress and attach an abstract of these uh, particular grants and fellowship applications as an additional attachment in case uh, uh, you have active applications in progress with other funding agencies, please also specify um, uh, the, the scheme and also mention what the project is all about, whether or not it has any kind of an overlap with uh, uh, the proposed project. Uh, we would also require you to uh, provide information on whether or not this is your first application to India Alliance. And in case you have applied before, uh, please provide the details of uh, uh, the outcome of that particular fellowship um, uh, application. So once you've filled in all these sections uh, and you have attached the required attachments, you can move on to the validation page. In the validation page, uh, you can you can generate a validation summary in case you have missed out on any required fields that need to be um, filled before uh, submitting the application uh, the validation summary page will highlight those you can easily go back to those sections fill the required information and then proceed uh, towards uh, submitting the application So this is just uh, to remind you once again that our uh, senior and intermediate fellowship competition for the basic biomedical research category is live. The call for applications uh, was uh, went live on 1st February 2021. We typically provide one month for uh, potential applicants to pull uh, to put together a preliminary application, and uh, uh, that's why the submission deadline is 1st March 2021, 2 p.m. So by that deadline, uh, the completed application form has to be submitted on the portal. I would request you all to, uh, specifically those who are planning to apply in this particular round, to complete these uh, all these steps well ahead in time and submit at least two days before the application deadline because some technical glitches may occur at the last moment. You may realize that there are additional documents that need to be supplemented. And uh, um, if you if you start this process ahead in time, it's, uh, it's highly likely that you will be able to submit within the deadline. We are very, very particular about a deadline. We do not provide any extensions to the deadline um, unless uh, there is a very, very valid reason for it. So uh, please stick to the deadline. Uh, another thing that you need to keep in mind is that by this deadline, the complete application has to be submitted. So this includes the letter of recommendation that has to come from uh, the supervisor that you add on the application. Uh, it is the duty of the applicant to coordinate with the person who would be providing a letter of reference and to ensure that um, everything, all the documents are in place before the application submission deadline. Any kind of delays will not be uh, accommodated uh, by us um, so that's it uh, with this uh, we come to the end of the presentation in case you have any queries you can uh, write to us at uh, info at india alliance.org for any grants and fellowships related queries uh, the standard response time is three business days, so I will excite, uh, I will request you to excite some patients, uh, especially if you're writing on a weekend. It may take us some time to get back to you. Uh, but then again, uh, within three business, I mean, rest assured that within three business days, we will get back to you. Um, another thing that you also need to keep in mind is that uh, we talk about our uh, fellowship schemes and um, mention about our uh, competition deadlines on our uh, uh, social media handles. So it's a good idea to start following us on our social media handles. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and um, on Facebook. And you can also visit our website for more updated deadlines. Uh, so that's it. I'd like to hand it back to Vanya for questions if there are any. Thank you, Sarah. That was a very, very comprehensive talk on the fellowship program that we have at India Alliance. And there are questions pouring in for you. And so be prepared to take them. Uh, yeah, just a 
So the first one is about, uh, are there any age restrictions? And uh, uh, also an uh, associated question with that from, uh, from the audience is that, is a permanent faculty position required for applying for the intermediate or the senior fellowship? If you can take both of these questions together. Sure, sure. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, our eligibility criteria is uh, assessed in terms of post PhD research experience. So we do not have any age or nationality restrictions. So essentially anybody from anywhere in the world who wants to work in an Indian host institution can apply to us. Our eligibility criteria uh, for the SIF scheme, the Senior and Intermediate Fellowships, is four to 15 years of post-PhD research experience. Our eligibility is calculated from the date of the PhD viva to the full application submission um, deadline for that particular round. So if you're applying for this round, you should have not completed more than 15 years of post-PhD research experience accounting uh, uh, for the non-research career breaks, if any, by say June of this year. So that's the tentative deadline, yes. Thank you. And, um, uh, I guess there yeah. was the uh, there was another question about having a permanent faculty position. So um, yeah, uh, on that note, I would like to say that you we don't require uh, you to have uh, a permanent faculty position at uh, the host institution before applying to us. You can, um, uh, like I mentioned uh, in, in the provision slide, that we do provide personal support towards um, um, the fellow the fellow's uh, salary so uh, that that kind of those, those funds can be met from the fellowship uh, funds directly thank you sarah uh, i would request uh, uh, my audience to keep adding their questions to the question box that they can see on their console and we'll take the questions from there um, the next question is can you elaborate uh, uh, about the role of the sponsor on a fellowship application Yes, so um, sponsors are uh, administrative heads who who uh, basically sign up to the India Alliance uh, award policies and conditions and uh, they ensure that you will be provided with the space in the host institution to carry out your uh, uh, proposed work. Uh, they're not supposed to provide any direct feedback to you on your project proposal if that's what you're asking. It's mostly an administ administrative requirement uh, so that you have all the tools at your disposal at the host institution to carry out the proposed work. So that's the role of a sponsor. Thank you, Sarah. There are a couple of questions about collaborators on the project proposal. So uh, one is that, can I choose collaborators from abroad? Is that possible? Uh, yes, your collaborators can be from anywhere in the world, but then your choice should, should be scientifically justified. So when you're adding your proposal, uh, you should know why you're adding, uh, 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 when you're adding a collaborator to your proposal, you should know why or, or what kind of expertise will they bring to your application. That is, uh, and the rest is up to you. They can be from uh, anywhere in the world. Yeah, I think our uh, speak, first speaker also highlighted the point that the role of collaborators is important to be justified on the fellowship application in terms of how they can contribute to your work. Uh, the next question is, can I add collaborators at a later stage if, if I do not add them at the application stage? Yes, that is um, uh, allowed in case uh, after activating your fellowship, uh, you uh, realize that you want to add more collaborators that can also be added at a later stage. It's not mandatory to be added at the uh, full application or the prelim application stage. Uh, a very practical question here. Uh, if I have made previous submissions to the fellowship, uh, do they have any influence on a fresh proposal? Uh, no. So if you have, um, um, so the short answer is no. Again, a resubmission policy will uh, kick in uh, in case you applied previously, uh, in case you applied a full application previously and it was declined for the same competition scheme. But in case you applied for any other scheme and now you're applying for a higher scheme, then uh, your uh, uh, past application will not have any influence on the on the decision on the fresh application. Thank you, Sarah. Um, here's a question about uh, other fu other funding programs uh, in relation to the India Alliance Fellowship. Can I apply for other extramural funding grants and fellowships? when my India Alliance application is under review. 
Is that possible? And also, is it po something that's possible after I have been awarded the India Alliance Fellowship? Right. So again, this is um, a question about our, uh, our dual fellowship policy. Um, researchers are free to apply for extramural funding while their application is under process with India Alliance. And even after they have been awarded, the only things to keep in mind here would be your time commitment. So as an India Alliance fellow, you are required to dedicate 80% or 70% of your research time to the India Alliance project, depending on the scheme that you're applying. In case you can justify the time commitment, you may apply for a grant. You cannot avail, as I mentioned before, you cannot avail uh, two fellowships together along with your, like any other fellowship along with your active India Alliance fellowship. And, uh, but in case you wish to apply, you can inform, uh, inform India Alliance, the fact that you're applying for any other fellowship. And if you're awarded, you will either have, I mean, you'll have to either relinquish India Alliance fellowship or the other fellowship, uh, depending on what you want to do uh, for the visit but at any given point of time you cannot have any other active fellowship with your india alliance fellowship so this just applies to fellowships not grants thank you sarah that was very helpful uh, i have eight years of research experience should i apply for intermediate or the senior fellowship what would be your suggestion uh yes so um again uh, you are the best uh, judge of your career stage. Uh, you can look at the mandates of our fellowship application. Uh, like I mentioned, even in my presentation, that intermediate fellowships are more for people who are setting up an independent research program. And senior research fellowships are for people who already have an established independent lab. So in case you have an established independent lab, uh, you can decide to apply for a senior fellowship. But in case you're in the early stages of, uh, or, or very early stages of setting up an independent research lab, it's just been one or two years, then uh, you can decide to apply for an intermediate application, uh, fellowship application as well. So this will completely depend on your career stage and whatever you uh, deem fit for yourself. Um, uh, I would I would also encourage our audience to please visit our website and go through all the information that is available on our website about the fellowship that would give them a very clear idea about the requirements of the fellowship. Uh, with that, the some uh, other questions that are pouring in. Um, it's uh, time for a budget related question. Is a budget estimate required in a prelim application? No, we don't require you to provide any kind of budget estimate at the prelim application stage. This is uh, information that will be required at the full application stage. And at that, uh, and at that stage, our uh, fellowship form will be more comprehensive. It will have entries for various uh, requirements that you may have. And you'll have to provide uh, suitable justification for whatever you're budgeting. Uh, but at the prelim stage, this is not required. Uh, this will be uh, something that we will look forward to in a full application. I did apply for the early career fellowship in the past. Am I still eligible to apply for the intermediate fellowship of India Alliance? Yes, uh, there is. Uh, it's not necessary for you to apply for an early, then an intermediate and then a senior. You can apply these in, um, fellowship programs are very independent of each other. So you can apply to either of the fellowship schemes depending on your career stage. Thank you, Sarah. A couple of more questions. Should the mentor be from the same host institute or from the same field of research? Oh, again, uh, so uh, we do receive a lot of queries about mentors. Um, the mentor can, can be anyone from anywhere in the world. Uh, the person does not need to be from your host institution or also from only your specific area of research. The role of a mentor is more broad in the sense that uh, they can provide you with feedback on your application, but they, uh, they are more likely to groom you to become an independent researcher. So somebody who can uh, who can comment on your career trajectory, help you write better grants and um, um, 
establish yourself in the research ecosystem so it can be anyone it does not have to like we don't uh, we don't have any specific requirements for the mentor to be from the uh, specific research area or from the specific research post institution again the choice will have to be justified by you so it's uh, it's the applicant's call who they want to add onto their application as a mentor and then uh, it's up to them to justify their choice as well Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that was very helpful, I think. Uh, here's a question about host institutions. What are the considerations for the choice of a host institution? Can the host institution be the same as the one where I did my PhD or my postdoc? Okay, uh, so uh, I will uh, restrict myself to answering questions about intermediate and senior fellowships right now. Um, so for Early career fellowships, we have a different policy. But for senior and intermediate fellowships, uh, you can choose any host institution which you think will provide you with the right tools and with the right environment to carry out your project goals and objectives. This can be your uh, PhD institution or your postdoc institution. It has to be a not for profit institution within India to which India Alliance can disperse funds. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the choice of the host institution is completely up to the applicant, keeping in mind all these other parameters. True. Uh, if I get a faculty position later, uh, can I change the host institution and transfer the fellowship to the new institution? Will that be possible under the uh, under the circumstances of uh, India Alliance Fellowship? Yes, uh, this is allowed and this is uh, um, a some of our fellows have also aware of this. In case uh, you do get a permanent position elsewhere and you want to uh, transfer uh, your fellowship to another host institution, uh, we would require some uh, uh, letters. Of, uh, we will require letters of support from the sponsor of the new host institution. But uh, the entire pro like you'll have to uh, follow due process, which is uh, outlined on our website. But then this there is this provision. So um, the short answer is this is yes, you can transfer your fellowship to another host institution. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a question about the word limit in the prelim application. Does the word limit of 750 words for the project summary in the prelim application include references? No, no. Uh, so uh, the 750 word, uh, the 750 word limit is only for your project summary. It is excluding references. So references will be attached in a separate, um, at a separate location as a separate list. This will not be counted in the whole 750 word limit that we have for the project proposal uh, summary. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, how many reference letters are required uh, at prelim stage? Um, at the prelim stage, you, uh, you are required to submit at least one letter of recommendation. So without one record, a letter of recommendation, uh, the system won't accept your application. But if you want to provide more letters of recommendation from um, your uh, supervisors, uh, that can also be done. You can add more than one letters of recommendation um, to your application. It is completely up to you. Uh, this is the judgment call that you have to make as to how many letters of recommendation have to be attached. It could, one is mandated by us, but it could be more than one. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a very related question is, uh, are mentors and referees the same? What is the difference between mentor, referee, sponsor, and external sponsor? Could you just clarify that for our audience? Sure, sure. Um, so I will um, start with the sponsor. Now, sponsor is the administrative head. Uh, this person will sign up to the India Alliance Award Conditions and Policies. They're not required to provide any feedback on your project. They're just supposed to ensure that you get the right uh, tools and the lab space in your host institution for you to carry out your work. So that is uh, the role of a sponsor. Coming to mentor, now mentor can be anyone from anywhere in the world, typically a senior researcher who can help you become more independent. Uh, so. This particular role is uh, optional for senior fellows, but it is mandatory for uh, our intermediate fellows at the full application stage. A mentor will not only provide feedback on uh, the proposal, I mean, they can or they may not, they may help the candidate in other ways in um, 
advising them on uh, other grants and applications, how to write an effective grant, um, how to prepare for interview, comment on the career trajectory. So th this is the role of a mentor. Um, and like I mentioned, it can be anyone from anywhere in the world. Next, we have external sponsor. External sponsor is the person in whose lab you will carry out your work outside host institution. Now, this particular role is not uh, mandatory at uh, even the full application stage. The, prelim, uh, the intermediate fellows can choose to avail this option, but if they have the resources to complete their project goals and objectives without going um, to another external sponsor's lab, they can choose to not avail this option. It's completely up to them. Um, the other role is of a collaborator. So typically, um, um, collaborators are people who bring extra expertise on your application. Again, these can be from anywhere in the world. Uh, the choice of a collaborator has to be justified. There should be scientific reason for bringing on expertise um, uh, from outside. Uh, when I say outside, I mean, um, you know, if you're adding somebody to your application, you need to justify why you want to uh, use their expertise uh, for furthering your project goals. So that's about it. Another question that we do receive while people are filling out the applications is, can my mentor be my um, external sponsor or can my mentor be my collaborator? So yes, uh, the like when I mention uh, that mentors can be anyone from anywhere in the world, your mentor can also be your sponsor. Your mentor can also be your external sponsor and your mentor can be your collaborator. So um, your sponsor, I mean, sponsor, of course, is a very exclusive role, like in the sense that uh, your sponsor has to be at the host institution for them to ensure that you will get the tools uh, required for your project. But mentors and collaborators can be from anywhere in the world and they can serve multiple functions on your application as well. I hope that clarifies um, this question about roles on the application. But uh, in case uh, you would like more or additional information, it's a good idea to visit our website. On our website, we have outlined what each role is for, whether or not uh, one role can serve another role on your application. All this information is outlined on our website. It's a good idea to visit our website and um, uh, go through uh, the details of the roles on the application. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think uh, this can be the last question of, of this uh, webinar. Are proposals on theoretical biology and biophysics accepted? Uh, is it necessary to propose wet lab research uh, in the CIF uh, fellowship? Uh, can the work be just basic research or should I have an applied research component? I think it would be good to just explain the mandate of India Alliance Fellowship, the CIF fellowship here. Correct, yes. So um, if you look at a remit, you would see that we fund uh, biomedical projects that have relevance to human and animal welfare. It's a very broad uh, scope remit. So if um, it can be like, I think the first question was about whether it has to be theoretical or wet lab. It can either be theoretical or wet lab based work. There is um, no specific requirements for it to be only wet lab based or only theoretical work. There's a lot of diversity in the kind of projects that we have sponsored uh, that we have funded in the past. And if you want to um, understand more about it, maybe you can go to our fellows profile and look out the kind, uh, uh, take a look at the kind of projects that we funded in the past. Um, the idea is that whatever question that you are investigating, it should be of relevance to human or animal welfare. As long as it is of relevance to uh, human and animal welfare, uh, the project uh, can be proposed as a part of the senior and intermediate fellowship schemes. Um, yeah, it can be theoretical, it can be wet lab. Uh, there are no um, restrictions or limitations on that. Thank you, Sarah. With that, I think we are at the last leg of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation and for taking all those questions. Um, and I thank our audience for being such a wonderful and engaged audience and uh, for sending us all uh, these questions. I hope you have found answers to many of the questions about grants writing and the SIF scheme. And if you have further questions, we'll be happy to engage with you further. So please do write uh, into our mailbox and we will get back to you. Uh, before we end the session, please allow me some time to make a few announcements which, could, which you could find useful. Uh, the senior and intermediate fellowship that we just discussed is currently open and is 
accepting applications and the deadline for that is uh, the 1st of March. Uh, we will launch the call of application for fellowships in clinical and public health research on 16th of February 2021 and the deadline will be 16th of March. So please look out our spaces on social media and on uh, or and on or or our website for more details on this. Uh, we are also currently accepting application for the EMBO lecture courses uh, uh, of India Alliance, which we provide in uh, partnership with EMBO. The calls for applications are currently open and the deadline is 1st of March. So if you're interested in hosting a lecture course, uh, you can write to us and apply for this. Uh, lastly, there is an online workshop, a science communication workshop that India Alliance is doing on the 16th of February. And uh, this is something that's very useful for researchers because uh, here we will discuss how you can take your science beyond publications and how you can engage with public through science communication. So the registration link is on the uh, screen and you can also find it on our website and at our social media spaces. So for more information, you can always visit our website. And um, that's all from us uh, today. Thank you for joining us again. And please take care of yourselves and keep safe. Goodbye from everybody at India Alliance.